All right, census two, we will get started here. So as a reminder, pen out, uh, test three, Monday, the material we're going over today um, will, will not appear on that. So the stuff we're going over is test four. And next week, Wednesday, you have two homework assignments due. No homework due next week, Monday. So that's just some uh, general announcements for reminders. And the topic that we've really been focusing on lately here is just the membrane of the cell, right? We talked about the, uh, the fluid mosaic model of the cell. And we talked about all the different components of it. And we talked about the proteins that are, are in the membrane as well. The next thing we're gonna talk about is how do integral membrane proteins actually end up in the plasma membrane, right? So as a reminder, what an integral membrane protein is, is a protein that usually goes all the way through the membrane. It, it's part of the membrane. It cannot function without being in the membrane. So the question is, how does it get there in the first place? And its journey to get into the membrane it begins with what's being shown here, which is called the secretory pathway, all right? So all proteins are made on ribosomes and they're made from mRNA. So when a protein is starting to be synthesized, if it is meant to be in the membrane on the end terminus, which is being shown here, there's a specific set of amino acids that will serve as a signal that will say this protein is meant to be in the membrane. That's what the signal peptide means. Here are some examples of different signal peptides, right? And what we can notice as a general trend is that there's usually a positively charged amino acid and then a long strand of nonpolar amino acids shortly after that. All right, so this is at the end terminus. So when this signal peptide emerges from the ribosome, what happens is that SRP will come and bind the signal peptide. So SRP is just a protein. And when it's not bound to the ribosome, it has GDP bound. However, when it binds to the ribosome, it's gonna switch out that GDP and have GTP bound. And what SRP does is that it stops the protein from further being synthesized. It basically pauses the ribosome from doing its work. Because if the ribosome continued to create this protein, and the protein would be born into the cytoplasm where it needs, and it needs to be in the membrane. So we stop that process. Once that process is stopped, SRP, the nascent protein, the protein that is being created, mRNA and ribosome, they will all travel to this complex. All right, and this complex is made out of two proteins. One, the SRP receptor and the translocon. These two proteins are in the rough endoplasmic reticulum membrane. So in the rough ER, 
you have two proteins called the SRP receptor and the translocon. The SRP receptor binds SRP. And the N-terminus of our new peptide goes into the translocon. However, synthesis of our new protein is currently halted because SRP is still bound to the ribosome. So to start synthesis again, we have to get rid of SRP. To do that, both SRP and SRP receptor have GTP bound. When this binding event happens, the GTP is hydrolyzed to GDP. Once that happens, SRP dissociates, dissociates from the SRP receptor, dissociates from the ribosome and translation can continue. So our protein is being fed into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now what happens to some proteins is that the signal is chopped off. So the N-terminus amino acids that said that you're supposed to be in the membrane, a lot of the times that will get cut off. It doesn't always have to be cut off though. And this protein will continue to grow and continue to grow. And in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, it will get any carbohydrates it needs. It will fold. And the parts that are supposed to go through the membrane will be inserted into the membrane of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. All right, so that's, that's the steps of how are the very first steps of how we get a protein into the plasma membrane. We grow it in the rough ER and stick it into the membrane of the rough ER. And then uh, today we're gonna look at the steps of transporting that protein from the rough ER to the plasma membrane. But with that, are there questions on how the secretory pathway works or any, any questions about anything I just went over there? All right, if not, we can move on. I have some questions just so we understand how this works. So in the signal peptide in the non or in the nonpolar region, often what you'll see is two leucines next to each other. Now the part of the SRP that cuts off the signal peptide is called signal peptidase, right? So just a hint, anytime in biochemistry, if you're talking about a protein, if it ends in ACE, it is usually an enzyme. So if there's a mutation in signal peptidase, so that when it's cutting off the signal peptide, it will always cut between the two leucines where normally if we go back to the previous image, usually signal peptidase cuts here. Whoops, that was not a very good circle, but usually it cuts right here. And what I'm saying is that there's now a mutation that will cut between every two leucines. And I want to know, what do you think would be the effect on this whole process if that happened? So think about that. 
See if you can come up with a couple ideas. So I'll give people like a minute here to, to just think of how this all relates and do some critical thinking on predicting the effect of a mutation. Um, and then I'll give you my thoughts on that in like a minute here. So uh, see if you can come up with any ideas. You would have sticky ends instead of blunt ends. Uh, that is DNA. Um, so a, T, C, G, T, A, G, C. The idea of a sticky end and a blunt end is when you're cutting DNA with the restriction endonuclease. If you cut here, that's a sticky end because you have overlap. While if you cut here, that's a blunt end. Uh, proteins don't have blunt ends and sticky ends. That's only with DNA because they hydrogen bond. But what would happen to a protein though if you cut between two leucines where you're not supposed to cut? Nonpolar section would be excised out? Well, normally it's supposed to be, right? Normally you're cutting here. And so the nonpolar part is usually cut off. Here, you're not doing that. So what could be the problems? Well, here's one problem I can think of, misfolded protein. So if you remember back from like chapter six, I actually don't remember what the chapter number was, but when we talked about 3D structure of proteins and we talked about how a protein folds, right? Now, normally for the proteins that are gonna be in the plasma membrane, they get the signal peptide cut off. So it's normally not supposed to be there when the protein's folding. However, if it's still there when it's not supposed to be, that could interact with the normal folding path a protein's supposed to take. So you will have non, new non-natural connections, interactions in your protein, and you could have a protein that no longer functions. So you could lead to a misfunctioning protein where the protein doesn't work. So that's that's one option I could think of. The other option is nothing happens. And that is, even though you have these extra amino acids, the protein can still fold just fine. And so having those extra amino acids actually doesn't cause any harm, right? So the, those are like the two possible outcomes I could see. One it totally messes up folding too. It doesn't do anything at all. And you don't actually know that until it happens. All right, so questions about that or about the, uh, uh, the pathway. Um, yeah, at all, now that you had a moment to think about it. So here's a good little review. The blank, which is found embedded in the ER, is a blank protein. And it has to do with what we just talked about. See if you can figure out that. Go, go back two slides. The blank which is found in the ER is a blank protein.
All right. So what is the SRP receptor is in the, uh, in the ER. What a signal peptide or signal protein is, is that when it binds, it releases like a signal inside um, the cell, or in this case, it would be inside the ER that starts a chain reaction. The SRP receptor, all it does is bind SRP. It's not really signaling anything. So it's not a... And the ribosome's not found in the ER. I mean, they can be, but they're also not. So it's a translocon. And let's, let's remember our, our terminology. Peripheral means that sometimes you hang on to the membrane, sometimes you don't. And if we look at the translocon, that image, it was a barrel that lets stuff in. Well, I cannot draw an angle. Let me try that again. It was a barrel that lets stuff in. So that's a transmembrane pore. It's going through the membrane, has a hole in it. So it is C. And one more question based on what I said, the signal peptide sequence is, is it one, two, three, or four? Actually, the answers are a combination of them. So see if you can figure out all the statements that release, relate to that signal peptide sequence. I'm looking at these. I actually didn't talk about all of these. So at this point, it will probably be kind of a guess to you. So let me let me talk about the signal peptide a little bit more. Um, so we did talk about four, and that's an A, B, C, and D. So um, I actually took this question from your book. So it's kind of ridiculous that they have option four and then put it in all the answers. So yeah, it is usually cleaved off of the completed protein. However, not all of the signal peptide sequences are always cleaved off. Sometimes the signal peptide will stay. And if it stays, what happens is that it will be put inside the, um, the membrane. So we know three and we know four. So now it's down to one and two. So often not used for small eukaryotic proteins or often used to direct proteins to the lysosome for incorporation into the lysosome. So the signal peptide sequence is for any protein that is gonna be membrane bound, right? So if, if you need to go to the membrane of anything, you need to have a signal peptide sequence because that's gonna transport you to the ER. And from the ER, you're gonna be directed to do different things. So two, it's not true. I mean, if you can be a small protein and still be, be needed in the membrane. And so one, I didn't talk about this, but if, if you need to be in the lysosome, you also have a signal peptide sequence. So that is one, three, and four. I would say, um, don't worry about like, for the test, right? Worry about um, like 
three and four are the big thing. We're not really going to go into the lysosome here. Um, but for the test, I would say as long as you can explain this to me and you know what a signal peptide is, you're going to be good. And the signal peptide, for the most part, says I'm a, I'm a membrane protein. Please bring me to the ER so I can be processed. And then just tell me the steps of, okay, once you have a signal peptide, what do we need to do to get into the ER? All right, so any questions about the secretory pathway here? All right, well, let me go on to our next PowerPoint, the PowerPoint for today then. Share that. There we go. All right. So once th that protein's in the ER, what happens then? That's what we're gonna look at. So we brought our protein that needs to be in the membrane to the ER using the secretory uh, pathway. Then it gets created and it gets carbohydrates attached to it. After that, we have this pathway. So after starting in the rough ER, we have to go to the Golgi apparatus for further processing. So any transmembrane secretory and lysosomal proteins will be created in the rough ER, and then they'll need to go to the Golgi apparatus. So let's look at the structure of the Golgi apparatus then. There are three different membranous sacs that we call cisternae, cis medial trans. Cis is closest to the ER, trans is the furthest, and the medial is in the middle, hence medial. So when you are going through the Golgi, you enter through the cis and you're going to exit through the trans. And you have two types of movement that you can travel through the Golgi apparatus. One is called antrograde transportation. And that is kind of like shown here, where like, and, and here, is where you form a little capsule and butt off let's say you butt off from the cis and then you go to the medial, right? And then you can butt off from the medial and go to the trans. So if you form your own little vesicle and you're going forward, that's called antrograde transportation. A second way to travel is that if you just stay in the cis and you don't move, what naturally happens is that these, you can kind of think of these as like, you know, escalators or moving walkways. If you've been, ever been in an airport with like those, those uh, moving conveyor belt walkways, this cis is naturally gonna move and turn into medial and then naturally move and turn into trans, and then all the trans is gonna disappear as it starts budding off. So if you're a protein and you just hang out in the uh, apparatus and just move with the cisterna as it becomes medial and becomes trans, that is called cisternal progression or maturation. And the last type of movement is if you actually go back. So let's say you're in the medial, you can actually go back to the cis. That is called retrograde. So three types of movement, right? Antrograde, you butt off and go forward. Retrograde, 
you go backwards. You butt off and you go backwards. Well, cisternal progression or maturation is that you just hang out. You don't butt off and you just ride the ride all the way to the end, right? Once you are in the trans, you're gonna be secreted as a vesicle where you will either go to the plasma membrane or you can go to the lysosome, all right? So you have a couple different options there based on your original signal peptide based on where you need to go. So any questions about that information? So here it's just a way to test, did you, did you get what that terminology was? So proteins, if you're passed by budding from one compartment to the next in a successive fashion, what is that called again? So maturation, cisternal progression, retrograde, antrograde, or medial grade. Yep. D, that was the antrograde, correct. Okay, so you come off the Golgi and you're floating around in a little vesicle. So um, if you don't remember what a vesicle is from biology, it's just a, I, I think of it as like a little ship that has its own um, bilayer. So you have your lipid bilayer here. Inside is what's called the lumen and then outside would be the cytoplasm, the cytosol. Here we are showing um, transmembrane proteins. So these are the proteins that went through the SRP and they got embedded into the ER. So this, this part was embedded into the ER. Then it traveled all the way through the Golgi and finally butted out. And here, whatever is in the lumen will be on the outside of the cell whatever is in the cytosol will stay in the cytosol. So the vesicles will go and they will travel to the, to the plasma membrane. And then we will, or they will fuse to the plasma membrane and something we'll talk about in a couple slides. And after that fusion, they're gonna fuse in such a way that the, like I said, the lumen's gonna be pointing out. And now you have a transmembrane protein. So in eukaryotes, Right? We don't create proteins at the plasma membrane to be put into the plasma membrane. We create them in the ER, take them through the Golgi, and then carry them on a vesicle to the plasma membrane. Uh, prokaryotes, they don't have Golgi, they don't have uh, ER, so they do actually create their own uh, proteins right at their plasma membrane. They use basically the same mechanism they have uh, SRP in, uh, in translocon as well, but that's just in their plasma membrane. And that's how they get transmembrane uh, proteins. And that's also a reason why their proteins aren't, don't have sugars on them, don't have carbohydrates, because all of that addition of carbohydrates that happens in the ER and also can happen in the Golgi. So that's, that's your big difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes there. Now, the proteins that make up the vesicles, we have different types of vesicles and they are determined by the proteins that make up the shell of the vesicles. And the three proteins we're gonna focus on are called clathrin, COP1, and COP2. So clathrin was basically the type of vesicle we were looking at on the last slide. They will take vesicles from the Golgi to the plasma membrane. So those, those vesicles have clathrin inside them. They form like a ball. They form that cage. COP1 vesicles, what they will do is that any protein that is meant to stay in the ER. That's what ER resident protein means. It means you are supposed to live in the ER. 
if you accidentally escape and go back to the and go to the Golgi, cop one will come and get you and then send you back home. Right? They will, that's the vesicle that goes from the Golgi to the ER. Another name for that is called Codimer. Um, more commonly nowadays is called COP1. So let me just actually draw this out. <clears throat> Excuse me, might be easier uh, with that. So if this is my plasma membrane, right? And here's my Golgi. Here's my ER. So if I'm a vesicle going here, that's clathorn. If I'm a vesicle going back to the ER, that's COP1. However, if I'm going from the ER to the Golgi, that's COP2. And since these proteins, these COP2 proteins, have to be in the ER for that to happen, they will actually travel back on COP1 as well. So COP2 will go here. The vesicle will break apart will fuse with the Golgi. Any COP2 proteins need to go back to the ER, so they'll travel on COP1. All right, so those are the three main proteins that make up the vesicles we're talking about today. Uh, questions about that idea? So let's look at clathrin as an example of how they make vesicles here. And clathrin is made from a protein called a triskelion. Um, it has three heavy chains and two light chains. So that is shown here. And it has this weird shape, which is shown here. So here's an actual like microscope microscopic image of a triskelion by itself. Um, and the reason why they're by themselves here is because of light chains. So light chains, when they're bound to the heavy chains, and they're called light and heavy just because of their size, the light chains stop heavy chains from forming a vesicle. Here's what a clathrin vesicle looks like. So as long as you have light chains bound, you're not going to form that. However, once these light chains go away, then you can form your clathrin vesicle and you can travel to the plasma membrane. Now this image right here is showing how COP1 and COP2 works. Remember COP2 from ER to Golgi, COP1 Golgi to ER. And we said on the last slide, COP1 will take ER resident proteins back to the ER. But remember, the cells, the cell's not smart. Proteins like don't have thoughts. So how do we actually decide if a protein is supposed to be in the ER? How do we know the protein escaped the ER that is supposed to live there? And that's due to its amino acid sequence. So most proteins that are supposed to be uh, in the ER forever, they have what's called a KDEL sequence or HDEL sequence in their C-terminus. So at the C-terminus, they will have either the amino acids KDEL and yeast is HDEL, or it could be KK anything, anything, or KKK anything, 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 right? That's what those axes mean, any amino acid. And in the Golgi, you have these KDEL receptors. And what a KDEL receptor will do is it will bind to that KDEL peptide sequence. So any protein that accidentally escapes the ER, they will bind to our KDEL receptor. And once we have proteins bound, we'll make our vesicle out of COP1. So here's, here's that process happening. We are COP1 proteins. Here is our, uh, our lipid forming the bilayer in the gray there. And then we're gonna butt off 
and return to the ER. So that is how we actually recognize you know, what protein should be in the ER and which one should not be in the ER. It's just the amino acids in the C-terminus. All right, so any questions about the information presented there? All right. So question two, um, this one's all about clathrin. So coated vesicles are used to ensure that enclosed proteins maintain proper orientation. So that, that, that means that like what's supposed to be on the outside of the cell, we're gonna orient it in such a way. So when they're traveling in the vesicle, they're gonna be in the right direction. So clathrin is one type of protein that coats vesicles and makes sure they're, they're going where they need to go and they will stay in the right orientation. So what is true about clathrin? B, they transport transmembrane proteins and GPI linked proteins from the Golgi to the plasma membrane. That is correct, right? Clathrin's whole job is to go from the Golgi to plasma membrane. Uh, GPI, so we didn't talk about that today, but we have talked about it before. GPI are those um, um, proteins that have a lipid attached to them and then a, uh, a big sugar chain. So that's what a GPI linked protein is, um, but yeah, Anything that's a transmembrane or a GPI must have must go to the Golgi first, and then the plasma. That's what clathrin does. So very good there. Question three: um, Which of the following proteins are probably ER proteins? And there are multiple answers for this. So no need to like answer this in chat. Just just unlike piece of paper. Go through A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and just say yes, ER protein, or no, ER protein. And these are C terminal residues. So uh, take a minute and refresh yourself on what should be in the ER based on the termini. So remember, if you're an ER resident protein, on the C-terminus, you have what's called a, either a KDEL, HDEL if you're in yeast, KK something something, K, 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 oops, that's a K, something, something, something. So GCTL, no, HDEL, yeah, that's in yeast. GDEL, no, KDEL, yep, KCAC. Nah, you usually need two lysines. Ardell, eh, probably not. You need a lysine. KKEA, yes. So that those are the type of sequences that will be on your C terminus tail if you are uh, supposed supposed to live in the ER.
All right. So you have come off the Golgi and you are going to the plasma membrane because you're an integral membrane protein and that's where you belong. And you're traveling on this clathrin vesicle. How do you actually fuse with the membrane? And that's what we're gonna look at here, what's called snare mediated ves uh, vesicular fusion. So on the vesicle that you're traveling in, on your clathrin vesicle, you have what's called an R snare. An R snare is a protein with a lot of arginines on it. And on the membrane you're traveling to, there's a similar protein called the Q snare, which is just a long protein with a bunch of glutamines. And you're looking at five to 10 different complexes on the vesicle and the target membrane. And what happens as the vesicle and the membrane come together, these snares are attracted to each other and they'll start winding around each other. When they are winding around each other, they are bringing the um, vesicle and plasma membrane closer together. Because you might not have thought about it before, but there are some forces you have to overcome for this fusion to happen. One, these the head groups of lipids are negatively charged, right? Well, so are the head groups of the plasma membrane. So you're trying to bring together two things that are very negatively charged, which they don't want that to happen. They don't want to interact with each other. So these proteins are helping to overcome that, overcome that repulsion. The other thing you have to overcome, there's a bunch of water here, right? This isn't just a vacuum. And so you have to push all of this water out of the way. And they don't wanna move because they're happy, they're hydrogen bonding. These snares are also helping to force the water out of the way because they're physically twirling around each other, bringing two, these two things together. So those are the forces you're, you're overcoming, the electrostatic repulsion and the uh, hydration penalty, removing water when it doesn't want to be removed, basically. As these snares are uh, twisting around each other, the next step in the process is you kind of have to remove these lipids. Again, that costs energy, but these, the, where the fusion happens, those lipids have to move away from each other. And that's not very well explained how that happens, but we know that must happen because as the lipids move away, these will want to interact, right? You will want to form a new bilayer, which is what you're doing. And so the snare will continue to twist, 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 causing this fusion to happen. And eventually they're gonna twist so much that your vesicle is gonna open up. Here, what we're doing is we're delivering um, molecules that need to leave the cell. So one thing um, that, that uh, so basically any signal that your protein needs to send out, this is how it happens. I was gonna say it's, it's like your nerve cell. Um, that would probably be the um, signal you're most used to where like it will send out calcium. Um, but any cell that needs to send out a signal will do that. And then eventually your, your vesicle will become part of the membrane completely and everything will be dumped out. Now this is incredibly fast inside the cell, uh, 0.3 microseconds. However, if you try this with like, if you make a membrane and a vesicle and you give them snares and you try this, it's gonna take you 30 to 40 minutes for this vesicle to fuse with the membrane, which means that it is not, not this simple, right? It's not just snares twirling around each other. There's other proteins involved. Um, so it's a much more complex picture than what's being shown here and what's what we really know about at this stage. But 
this is the basics of membrane fusion here with the vesicle. So any questions about what's going on here with the snares? All right. So here's a question again, just to test yourself on the snares. Which of the following best describes why snares are useful? Yep, C or three, right? Snares, like I said, electrostatic propulsion between the lipids and helping them fuse. Yep. Now, viruses that want to um, get inside our cell, like influenza or COVID, I guess would be a much better example now. Um, and that's just kind of off topic thinking about that wonder if the next edition of all biochemistry tech books will replace all their influenza. Like, here's an example of a common virus too. Here's what happens with COVID because it's more or less the same thing. Um, but to get inside of our cells, a lot of viruses have things that are similar to snares. And we're going to look at the flu's hemagglutin. Now, what influenza has is they have a region on them that binds to salic acid. Salic acid is the carbohydrate we talked about in GPI linked proteins, right? So in GPI linked proteins, you have salic acid. And influenza will look for this on your cells and bind to it. Once they bind to it, their hemagglutin will go through what's called, what's like a jackknife movement. And if you don't know what that means, like here's a folded knife, a jackknife is one that's gonna like fold out. So it's kind of like a spring event that's happening. And when this tag like springs out, what it does is that it pulls the virus closer to the cell. This picture is trying to show that. I, I don't think this picture is very good, but it's what's in the, uh, what the best one I found on the internet, where like here you can see this whole conformation of this peptide and this, this is hemagglutin. It all shifts up, so it like springs up 180 degrees. And when it does that, it's going to bring the virus closer to the membrane. And once the virus is close to the membrane, you can start that fusion process again that we just talked about. And what's going to be secreted into your cells is viral RNA or sometimes DNA. Then your cell is gonna start making those viruses, release them, and then all the viruses can go into other cells and continue their replication process. But that's th the snare thing that we just talked about. Viruses basically do the same thing. They just bind to a sugar on our cells and then like snap into place. They, they get pulled forward. And the flu case is called hemagglutinin, which one way, and this is actually how a lot of the vaccines, um, I know I got the Moderna vaccine, so I looked into it. This is how the Moderna uh, COVID vaccine works. Um, uh, COVID has a spike protein that will you that basically does the same thing, that punctures your cell. 
um, to get into uh, your, your uh, cell. And how the Moderna vaccine works is that they put RNA into you. So your body makes the spike protein. And we create antibodies towards the spike protein, right? And then you get a second dose of it. And then you just boost your immune system to really look for that spike protein. And so when, when the real COVID virus enters your system, right, that spike protein is needed to um, uh, go into your cells. So it's critical for COVID to work. So you can't really mutate that away easily. So COVID's not going to change that spike protein, which is why it's such a good target, because all COVID will have that protein, and then our antibodies will be against that spike protein. So by targeting the, the, the thing that causes COVID to enter your cells, by, by um, having a vaccine that makes antibodies towards that, that's how um, you, we build up resistance and try to become immune to COVID. That being said, if a COVID variant exists that changes its spike protein, so makes a different spike protein, um, all the vaccines will be for nothing. And we will become, uh, we would have to create a whole new vaccine, which is why even though vaccines are still out, they're still asking you to be diligent because by if COVID still spreading throughout the population, it has a chance to mutate and it would be horrible if in one of those mutations is, I got a new spike protein, the antibodies don't work. So, um, but with that, that's all the time we have for today. So as always, I will put up a homework. Remember, you're gonna have two parts due on Wednesday because we have our test on Monday. So you'll see a part one and part two for Wednesday next week. Um, Oh, and next week, Friday, I know I will not be around. So there will be no live lecture next week, Friday. I'll put up a video. Um, I'll put up a reminder for that on Blackboard, though, as well. Um, other than that, thank you for stopping by. Thank you for watching on YouTube. Hope you learned something. If you have any questions, please always let me know. Otherwise, hope you have a good rest of your day. Take care.